The Rebel Capitalist Show. What role do you think the domestic commercial banks will have if we move into a system of a Fed coin, central bank digital currency? That is really a great question and one that gets debated all of the time because the commercial banks are the are the um, intermediaries between Fed and government policy and the public. Mm-hmm. And with the advent of the Fed now accounts, which are already in place, and when we convert to the Fed coin, it almost could bypass them. So they're trying to figure out a way to keep them on a level as inter- intermediaries right. and then and then bypass that as well. But I think that's why fintech is so important to the big conglomerates, Chase, Bank of America, et cetera, that they're waking up to that fact, I think, slowly. You know, you can't turn a ship in a thimble of water. It takes a minute. Uh, But I think that that everything is morphing. Mm -hmm. So when I look at what their role is, um, and I did a piece on this, I don't know, a year or so ago, where I looked at the sticky relationship that banks have with their customers, right? Yeah. You set up a bank account, you, how often do you change it? You, you really mm-hmm. don't change it, right? But then you've got these, uh, all of these big fin- financial or digital companies like Meta and Google, et cetera, that knows every habit of yours, right? They know everything. And so now what we've been seeing is a merger between the two. And I think that's their position is to cross that, your complete that, that bridge or complete that integration and just have a lot more control to feed data to the Fed. So it's the roles of the commercial banks are shifting, but they're also shifting to retain uh, all of that power. It'll just look a little different. Yeah. Yeah. So just, they'll just be branches of the Fed uh, to yeah. serve a purpose of Big Brother. Sir, uh, absolutely. Full surveillance <laughs> economy. They, they know everything, really, they know everything about you. I mean, all the research that I do online, you think they don't know that I'm doing it? Now, yeah. I'm a little fish, so I don't know that they care, but I could be wrong about that, but I don't know that they care. But um, yeah, have I self-centered to make, or self-censored to make sure that I could stay online and be helpful to people? You know, one thing I've always wondered, and I have, I have no proof of this, but it, it seems odd. I remember in the 1970s, I grew up in the 1970s and the 1980s, and I would go to the bank with my father. And if he went down, let's say in the 1970s, if he went down to deposit like $1,000 in cash or something at, at, at a bank, and if one of the tellers would have asked him where he got the money, Lynette, he would have absolutely lost his mind. Yep. I mean, he would have gone off on them yep. on how it is absolutely none of yep. their effing business. Yep. And that is a completely inappropriate question to ask me. And this person should be fired immediately. You know, And we've gone from that to... Now, when I go down and deposit uh, cash or, or pretty much anything, I've noticed that, and this is increasingly so, I didn't really notice this too much back in like the late 90s, the early 2000s, but it really started happening after the GFC. And now it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And I don't know if you've noticed this, or maybe the listeners oh. or viewers have, where the, the tellers, the first, oh, so it's not just how is your day. It's, oh, what do you do for work? Oh, oh, you oh, I saw you're driving a car out there. Is, is that new? I mean, they're asking you all of these prying questions. And it's like, I know you don't care about me. Are you asking those questions because I'm somehow being recorded and, and you're trying to gather intel that's going straight to NSA or something? I mean, why are you asking me these questions that have nothing to do 
with banking or even how my day is, you yeah. know, and, and, and taking it. And of course, if you go down and deposit this, the thousand dollars again, you're still going to get those questions to a greater degree. Oh, where'd you get the money? Oh, wow. A thousand dollars in cash. Whew. Boy, I haven't seen that type of money. Well, boy, what do you do for work? You know, or it, and it's always these prying types of questions. Like that's their only purpose as a teller is to gather or extract information from you. Am I just being <laughs> overly paranoid or have you noticed this as well? I have noticed that all I don't do my own banking, but um, really since the great financial crisis, uh, it, since 2008, you know, that's really when the system died and shifted and things became more obvious. And you might even recall that's that's when you started getting a couple pennies on your checking account. Hmm. So that's when they began to slowly uh, reveal the truth, which is this is not really your money. Once you deposit it, you're <laughs> loaning it to them. And this money is debt-based anyway, so it's really not your money. You just don't, Federal Reserve, no, you just don't realize it. It's just that they stopped um, hiding it as much and even forgetting the deposit. I mean, heaven forbid you want to wire 25,000 or 100,000 for gold or silver. It's none of their business, but it is their business because it's not your money. It is only your perception. That's what makes really gold, silver, physical in your hands. Now you got real money. Mm -hmm. And who's going to question you about that? Because it's invisible. Yeah. No, you're right. Do you, th do you think, uh, and this is another thing I've been trying to get my head around. Because I, I do a lot of research on the euro dollar system. Mm -hmm. And you know, I talked to Snyder about that every opportunity I can. And I was looking at a chart, and I'm actually going to use this in a presentation on Friday, of the bank reserves held at the Fed mm -hmm. going back to, I think, like 1960, something mm -hmm. like that. And you can look at that compared to a chart of like M2 money supply or GDP growth or global GDP growth. And you see, and as you know, well, most of the people watching this video, those bank reserves are a, just a tool that the banks can use to expand their balance sheet. They're not lending them out, but they can use those to back up uh, new loans that are being created, new dollars that are being created. Right. But in 1987, the amount, the total amount of bank reserves at the Fed was about 60 billion, six zero billion. In 2007, just before the GFC, it was 40. It went down by $20 billion, yet M2 went from, call it 2.7 trillion up to 7.5 trillion. Think about what global GDP did. It went completely exponential. Mm -hmm. So you, you sit there and, and think, okay, well, this has to be you know, on, on the bank's balance sheets, they have to be increasing, they have to be doing all this stuff outside of the Fed's balance sheet. And then in 2007, when we have, or 2008, when they have the GFC, mm -hmm. the bank reserves go from 40 billion up to 3 trillion. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, we're up over, well, we were up over 4 trillion. It's probably come down a little bit. But um, the first point there is, you can see that the system that we had completely broke. Oh yeah. Completely broke. That's why I and always it's say never, that. And it's never been fixed. So what I tried to think about is let's just assume that the federal reserve never did anything. They didn't bail out the system. They didn't bail out the global financial system. They didn't have uh, you know, we didn't have the TARP program. Uh, they didn't do quantitative easing. None of it. They just let free market capitalism work. Because we had this system that was producing all of this global liquidity just contract that obviously we would have gone through a massive depression, but we would have had to come out the other side with a different type of system, a different right. source for the liquidity. Do you think we would have gone back to a gold standard? No, um, not at this point, because what gold does is it requires fiscal responsibility. So we won't, we won't do that until enough confidence is lost and they need to regain our confidence. 
that that's when we'll go back to a gold standard because I don't know any politician or any banker that is ready to be fiscally responsible. And I will also say, since you talked about the reserves, it was in 2008 for the first time that the Fed started paying interest yeah, right. on those reserve balances. Right. Now we are in an ample reserve uh, system, which yeah. means they're just creating that. And there is such a tight, or there was during 2008, I haven't looked at it in a little while, but it broke down. There was an extremely tight correlation between the monetary base and the amount of reserves that were held by the banks at the Fed. Because what they were doing was just creating the money and giving it to the banks and then paying interest on it so that they were guaranteeing some level of profitability you know, for the banks. But 100%, I agree with you. And I've said this since 2008, that was when the system died. Yeah, and sure. even going back to what we were talking about with the bank accounts and how intrusive it's gotten, you know, you could sit there and you could just watch all of the laws. Like I had two girls in college during that period of time. And it was pretty normal. I'd call them up you know, or they'd call me, usually they would call me, right? And I'd say, oh, it'd be around dinner time. And I'd say, oh, what are you doing? Oh, eating dinner. Oh, what are you having for dinner? A uh, cereal. Well, how come you're having cereal? Because I'm out of money. So, <laughs> I, so the next day I would go down to the bank and I would deposit maybe some cash or maybe a check or something like that. But I would make a deposit into their accounts. It, it typically in cash was pretty frequent for me. Well, after 2008, you couldn't deposit cash into somebody else's account. Right, right, right. Right, yep. right. So what they've done since that period of time, whether people, real, I know that most people don't realize it, but they've changed the rules and they've, They've made that noose around your neck and your ability. You know, they've made it smaller and smaller and smaller. So now you get all of that intrusion, but the banks are still reaping the benefits and the rewards of all of the Fed's intervention because the banks are too big to fail. And there's the, the four key ones, what JP Morgan, uh, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, all and Bank of America. Yeah. 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 I mean, those those are really the four commercial banks that control everything. And as often as they get caught with it, I'm sure there's a lot more that we don't ever know, but they just pay the fines. It's part of doing business. And and they never or rarely, I should say, uh, accept responsibility for their crimes. So they didn't admit any wrongdoing. But here's you know, 950 million, which to you and me would be a lot of money. But to them, that's chump change. It's just the cost yeah. of business. Yeah, and they can take limitless risk because they always know they're going to be bailed out. It's just this this ultimate moral hazard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely.